So with going through what I can only describe as a midlife crisis of sorts, I've picked up on one thing. The music that I listened to in my youth was pretty damn good the more I think about it. And like many an angst-filled young person of the time, that means I listened to an absolutely absurd amount of alt-rock. Which got me thinking, what is alt music actually alternative to anymore? And to go into this a little deeper, we have to go back. And I mean, way back. While most people will tell you that the modern alt music movement began in the 90s with grunge, which while it does hold a lot of merit and validity, I believe we have to go all the way back to the 1960s. And in the early part of the decade, garage rock came onto the scene, which was started as a response to your Beatles, Stones, Who, etc. And insert whichever early, more traditional classic rock group here, if you will. And the reason I consider this the first alt-rock subgenre was because of a more heavy-hitting, raw, and overall fuzzy sound that a lot of other groups at the time just didn't offer in their music. Bands like the Kinks, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and later groups like the Count Five were able to establish themselves as some of the more popular and successful groups within this new subgenre. And that allowed them to push the envelope of both what rock and pop music could sound like. Which leads us to... King of the Dance, motherfucker! Again, I'm going a bit against the grain here, but I honestly believe that punk's origins can be traced as far back as the late 60s. If garage rock set the mold and kind of furthered the possibility that alternative music can exist, punk music shattered that mold and set it on fire. Fueled by an anger at the world and a desire for that anger to be heard, bands like the Sex Pistols, the Ramones, Black Flag, and countless others blazed a new trail of their own. Punk took the sound that garage rock started, stripped it down, and turned it up to 11. The structure and instrumentation of the music became much less defined as it had been before. Blazing fast and distorted guitar and bass work, loud, impactful, and politically charged vocal work and lyrics, combined with the heavy drum hits that was the backbone of a lot of this music, set up a DIY and anti-establishment tone that furthered punk and made it different from a lot of other subgenres. Punk was the first subgenre that actually felt entirely alternative, especially compared to the 70s crap rock and prog that was beginning to dominate the music scene. But, as always, the record industry gets their greedy little hands on it and starts to change things. In the mid to late 70s, the recording industry did what the recording industry does best. Take an underground genre with a big cult following and make it commercially accessible. You maniacs! You blew it up! Now, I'll be the first to admit that I do tend to prefer post-punk as opposed to punk, but I can't argue that it has a much more pop-forward and commercial sound. While post-punk did share a lot of the same elements that punk did earlier, post-punk did ultimately scale back the sound that punk established. With that came more traditional guitar and bass work, the drum work became more focused and less frenetic, and the vocals focused more on the low-end range of the spectrum while losing a lot of the edge that Punk's vocals had. Artists like Talking Heads, Blondie, Patti Smith, etc. were able to still succeed and thrive in this new sound. Frankly, most of that is due to the fact that it was more accessible to a commercial public. There's a reason people still talk about those three artists among others. Because of that more commercially accessible nature, it opens the doors for more people to discover it. A lot of people aren't into that harder, more angry edge that punk had. This served as a good middle ground from punk and more traditional rock and pop music. But unfortunately for me, here's where things begin to get much more pop and commercial focused. <laughs> While most people believe that post-punk and new wave are interchangeable, to me, they feel completely different in that most new wave music is frankly just glorified pop. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's indicative of what often happens within music. As those underground styles and subgenres begin to gain traction, the odds are pretty good that it'll become commercialized. Gone are the low-end instrumental works, low-ranged vocals, and most importantly, DIY attitude of punk and post-punk, and are now largely replaced with drum machines, synthesizers, and more flowing vocal work. 
When you think of new wave music, especially new wave of the 1980s, this is likely the image that you'll have in your mind, and for good reason. I want my MTV! I want my MTV! I want my MTV! With MTV being a massive overnight success, new artists in this sound were able to get much more exposure than they ever would have had the chance of getting. And because of this, New Wave was able to explode into the music zeitgeist, reaching its peak popularity sometime around the mid-1980s, before, you know, crashing and burning just as fast. Oh, wait, hold on, I need to get dressed for the occasion. Yeah, that's more like it. Okay, now with the broad historical context out of the way, we can finally move into grunge. Originating out of Seattle, Washington in the late 80s and early 90s, grunge infused elements of punk, garage rock, metal, and hard rock. Deep bass grooves, simple but effective percussion work, combined with fast pace and frenetic guitar work, helped establish this new harder, rougher sound within rock music. And a whole lot of... Okay, but in all seriousness, grunge was able to combine the best of both worlds. Massive commercial success, and the style and attitude of the preceding subgenres. And for the first time in two decades, it felt distinctly alternative to something, compared to being incredibly pop-focused like New Wave was. Bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Stone Temple Pilots helped establish grunge as a dominant commercial and artistic force in music. And bands like Green Day, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Rage Against the Machine helped bring in new audiences that grunge couldn't, as well as potentially help bring back some other audiences that left in the preceding years. But as with everything else in pop culture, all good things must come to an end. A body has been found at the Seattle area home of Kurt Cobain. The body was discovered this morning by an electrician who had arrived at the singer's Lake Washington home. Kurt Cobain's death in 1994, combined with rampant drug abuse among some of the subgenre's most well-known frontmen, assisted in bringing down grunge almost as fast as it rose. This dominant and popular subgenre within the alt sphere had just lost its most iconic and popular frontman, and to many, the music along with it. And much like post-punk and new wave before it, a lot of post-grunge began to shift to a more pop-focused sound. Although it wasn't all bad when you think about it, Former Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl formed Foo Fighters. Bands like Bush and Collective Soul were things. And while there were some more out there groups like Beck's Early Work or Morphine's Cure for Pain, as well as the upcoming Garage Rock revival with bands like The White Stripes and Black Keys, the alt scene was once again beginning to change indefinitely. But like all good things comes the very, very bad. Look at this photograph. Every time I do it while post-grunge and the garage rock revival produced some great music, to me it just felt more cold than the preceding subgenres. There were bands like Queens of the Stone Age adopting a more hard edge to their sound that ventured into garage rock and grunge territory, while bands like Three Doors Down, Hooba Stank, Stained, and Three Days Grace did their own things. Through this very, frankly, anecdotal evidence, all of these subgenres within the broader alt genre were beginning to merge into one and kind of go off on their own path. Which leads us to where we are now. Wait, that can't be right. I feel like I'm forgetting something somewhere. What popular and incredibly nostalgic subset of alt rock am I forgetting? Oh yeah, you better believe we're bringing up pop punk here. Now, granted, bringing this up is mostly due to my own sense of nostalgia, but in spite of that, I do believe discussing it holds some merit here. It takes a bit more heavy instrumental work and darker lyrical content and makes it more accessible for the masses. It felt like it brought something new to the table instead of just being the same droning things that we had heard for almost the last 20 years. And it helped bring in a much younger demographic. I mean, as a brief aside, I was, I think, 10 years old when pop punk really started to take off before like grunge almost crashing just as fast. So that's why it holds a place in the discussion. It helped change things again and bringing in new blood, something that the subgenre desperately needed. But if you thought things had fallen apart before, now is where things really start to fall off.
if alt rock had dealt with its peaks and valleys before to me in 2020 and 2021 it feels like we're at the bottom of the ocean i mean look at billboard's year-end alt music list from 2020 what is any of this actually alternative to to me it's glorified pop music that is only alternative to shitty pop music which by definition makes it alternative to something it is different to the dominant genre, which in this case is pop music. But because of this massive shift, it has caused more people than I can count to scream from the rooftops, Oh, rock music is dead, it's all pop and everything is bad now. No. No, it is not. I mean, Green Day is still here for some reason. And there are still some great groups out there on smaller indie labels. For example, two of my favorites being Psychedelic Porn Crumpets and Slift. Seriously, for anyone who's watching this who wants to explore and find new music, I highly recommend you check out Bandcamp, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, wherever you get your music. Because there are tons of great groups out there who you are not going to hear on the radio or see on Twitter or any other kind of media platform. You have to go search them out yourselves. And the more I've thought about this over the last few years, that is a great thing for music, especially rock music. Now, instead of catering to record companies and having to worry about how many albums they can sell in X amount of time, artists have a much larger ability and freedom to make the music they want how they want to. And because of that, we get a much more interesting and diverse musical landscape. It's not like any of the music from the past has just gone away all of a sudden because new music has come in. That new music gets to supplement the old. It's fascinating to me to see how some artists pick different sounds and styles from artists from 50 years ago. It's incredibly enjoyable and fascinating to see how music has evolved. It really is interesting and fun to see how music has evolved. That is one of the great things about music. Yes, it evolves and grows, changes sounds, becomes more commercial and sells out, but the mentality usually sticks. Without the Beatles, we wouldn't have had garage rock, and then punk, post-punk, new wave, grunge, whatever the 2000s was, and where we are today. So let me know down below, do you think that rock music is dead and can it ever make a successful comeback? And are there any albums that you're looking forward to this year, be them huge releases or smaller indie acts? Let me know, I am dying to listen to some new music and I'm curious to what you guys have to say.